In the last video, Receptor Proteins 2, we learned how ionotropic receptors function. In this video, we'll discuss how metabotropic receptors work. You can already see by looking at the picture that there are some differences between the two uh, receptor types. In both types, we have a receptor protein, which you can see here. Uh, and the binding site also exists on both. The difference it comes in this particular structure down here, which we'll talk about in a moment, and this other uh, protein that's also embedded in the plasma membrane, which you can see right here. Just like with an ionotropic receptor, we have to have a neurotransmitter, and that neurotransmitter will be released by the presynaptic neuron and then it will cross the synapse and bind with the binding site on the receptor protein. With a metabotropic receptor, when the neurotransmitter binds, we do not get the opening of the channel like we did in an ionotropic receptor. In other words, the metabotropic receptor does not function as an ion channel. Rather, when the neurotransmitter binds to the metabotropic receptor, that causes this structure to be activated. This is known as a G protein. And we'll talk about it in just a little bit more detail in a moment. The point is, when the neurotransmitter binds, that causes activation of the G protein. Okay, so the G protein is composed of three different subunits. There's a gamma subunit, a beta subunit, and an alpha subunit. When the G protein is inactive, these three subunits are uh, combined into one G protein. However, when the neurotransmitter binds and produces the activation, the gamma subunit and the beta subunit stay together, but the alpha subunit dissociates from the others. And so the alpha subunit is now free to move around through the inside of the neuron and affect the chemistry, the internal chemistry of the neuron. Okay, well there are two different ways that an activated alpha subunit can affect the internal chemistry of the neuron. One of those ways is known as the, the shortcut pathway. And in the shortcut pathway, well, let's, let's go ahead and get that labeled. So we have shortcut pathway. And this particular pathway is not terribly different from the ionotropic receptors that we talked about in the last video. The big difference between the two is you don't get a channel through the metabotropic receptors, rather you have to activate the G protein. But then the activated G protein can come over and it can affect this um, ion channel that's already embedded in the plasma membrane. Now this ion channel is not a voltage gated channel and it isn't a, a transmitter gated channel either because the transmitter is actually interacting with the metabotropic receptor. But the alpha subunit can cause a change in this ion channel and there are two changes that could occur. The ion channel could have been closed before the neurotransmitter activated the, the receptor and in that case then the alpha subunit would open the channel and if the channel were to open, then we could either get an influx of some type of ion or we could get an efflux of some type of ion. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that prior to the activation of the G protein, this channel was already open. And so when the alpha subunit was uh, dissociated from the rest of the G protein, it could then cause this channel to close. And that would keep ions either from entering the neuron or exiting the neuron. With either one of these, though, what we're going to see 
is a change in the flow of ions after the G protein is activated. And that change in the flow of ions will have an impact on the uh, membrane potential of the neuron. This is very similar to what we saw with the ionotropic receptors. Okay, so that is our shortcut pathway. And before we go any farther, we ought to consider a question similar to the questions that we looked at in the previous video. If you activate a G protein and you then cause, let's say, the channel to open up, what would happen if a positive ion that is located here inside of the neuron exited through the channel? What would be the effect? All right, well, let's, uh, let's take a look at our oscilloscope again. We have our positive pole and our negative pole, and here's our, here's our zero point. And let's talk about an actual neurotransmitter system that is used in our body. In the last video, we talked about uh, GABA interacting with an ionotropic receptor and allowing uh, chloride to enter through that. Now we're going to talk about a new type of GABA receptor, a metabotropic one, and we'll label this one GABA-B. That's its actual name in the neuroscientific literature. So if GABA-B binds to its receptor protein, or if GABA binds to the GABA-B uh, receptor protein, I notice I left off the cross on the T there, then what's going to happen is we'll activate a G protein. The G protein then dissociates the alpha subunit, which then causes a channel to open up and a neurotransmitter that we are all, I'm sorry, an ion that we're already familiar with, potassium ion, which is located on the inside of this neuron, we start to see potassium ions exit through the channel. As they exit, we're going to cause a change in the membrane potential. So if we have a neuron that's at rest, negative 70 millivolts, and we start to lose positive ions, that's going to cause a hyperpolarization. And the hyperpolarization is due to the fact that those potassium ions are exiting from the neuron. So the net effect of having a positive ion leave would be to cause hyperpolarization of the neuron. Okay, so that's an example from our, our shortcut pathway. Now we're going to take a look at a second way in which metabotropic receptors can function. And these are called um, second messenger cascades. And you can see we still have a metabotropic receptor, we still have a G protein, and at some point we're still going to have an effect on an ion channel of some type. So once again, we have our neurotransmitter it's released by the presynaptic neuron, and the neurotransmitter fits into the binding site. And binding with this metabotropic receptor will, cause, will activate the G protein. So we activate the G protein, which again is the same thing. We're going to have our, our gamma and our beta subunits stay together and our alpha subunit will dissociate from the rest of the G protein. And it's now free to interact with other substances that could be found in the cytosol. In this case though, instead of directly interacting with the ion channel, the alpha subunit will interact with another substance. Let's just say an enzyme because that's a pretty common way for it to happen. Um, Oops, spelled that the wrong way. Okay, now this enzyme or whatever it may be that the alpha subunit interacts with has a special name. We'll refer to these as second messengers. Okay, so this would be a second message, messenger, or if we activate more than one enzyme, we have, we have second messengers. And then the second messenger, 
can produce some kind of effect on the ion channel. And just like before, if the ion channel was closed before the neurotransmitter bound with the receptor protein, then it would now open up. Or, if the ion channel was already open, then when the neurotransmitter binds with it, it would close. In either way, we're going to have a change in the flow of ions across the membrane, so we'll have a difference in, or a change in, the uh, membrane potential. Now, it can be more complicated than this. Sometimes the alpha subunit will activate a second messenger, which will then go on and activate another second messenger, which may be another enzyme, which could possibly activate another second messenger, and you get the idea that could happen over the course of several different um, second messengers. Eventually, though, these second messengers will cause a change in the ion channel, either opening one that was closed or closing one that was already open, so that we get a change in the flow of ions and consequently a change in the membrane potential. Well, I think this leads to a, a question. And that question is, why would we even bother to have these um, second messenger cascades? This process right here is called a second messenger cascade. And the answer to the question is actually relatively, um, relatively simple. One single G protein, I'll, I'll just come over here and make this a little bit more clear. One G protein, once it's activated, could actually activate 10 to 20 different second messengers. And just to keep our illustration simple, let's put three here. Let's say one activated G protein activates three different second messengers. These three different second messengers, in turn, could activate many other second messengers. We'll just do three here, and I'm not going to draw them out, all of them, because that would be tedious. But I, I think you get the idea that if you have this kind of cascade, it doesn't take very long before you have lots of chemicals floating around inside of the neuron that could cause a widespread effect on channels located in that neuron. So rather than just opening or closing one channel, this single G protein that's activated could lead to changes in dozens of ion channels. And that would provide a, a, a quick way of causing a widespread change in the membrane potential of the neuron. And so there's a difference between ionotropic receptors and metabotropic receptors. And in the next video, we'll examine those differences in a little bit more detail. But for the purposes of this video, we now understand that there are shortcut pathways where a G protein uh, will directly change an ion channel. And then there's also the second messenger cascades, which will activate lots of second messengers and have a widespread effect on ion channels in the neuron.